I am Keith McCullough and welcome back to another Real Conversation. It's always my pleasure to have Dr. Pippa on. You're a fan favorite here, Dr. Pippa. Thank you for making the time with us today. I, I absolutely appreciate it. Hey, man. The, um, uh, the, I guess maybe the first place that we could start here is just to jump in, because what I'd like to do is kind of go through like a, what I'd call a, a full OODA loop, or as John Boyd would call it, a full OODA loop, which is observe, orient, decide and then act, and you're really good at, at addressing a situation and then coming up with a bigger picture. I think that that's what a lot of people know um, know you to be, and, uh, and I don't uh, suspect that you'll uh, disappoint in terms of doing that. So maybe, maybe we start with the problem first and then an assessment of that, and then we can go uh, to where a lot of people want to go, which is the other side, um, or you know, the, there are obviously some, some, some negative things to talk about all the way along that path too, but maybe let's just start with COVID and how you see it. Uh, so bottom line, here's where we are. Uh, the second frontline patient of COVID, after you've dealt with the actual humans getting it, the next thing is the economy. And like COVID, the economy is, is not in danger of dying just all by itself. It's because COVID is, ex is exposing the pre-existing conditions. And those include ridiculously excessive debt, and total lack of cash, right? There's just no cash flow. And also, like with COVID, the body sometimes turns on itself, right? One of the things that kills you with COVID is not the disease, but what they call the cytokine storm, which is your immune system reacting and it's the immune system, the immune system kills the patient, not the disease. In the same way, in capitalism, we're seeing businesses shut themselves down. They're committing suicide. If you're a restaurant, you shut yourself down well before the, the disease shuts you down because the debt and the lack of cash flow means you'd rather have a known loss than an unknown loss. And since you can't estimate how long this is going to last, I think we're seeing many, many businesses going bust that are, you know, Main Street level, retail, consumer level. And one of the problems right now is that policymakers are, have several opinions about this that I think may be off. One of them is the belief that this is just like an alarm clock and you can hit the snooze button and when you're ready an hour later or a month later, you can just turn the economy back on. And I think that is not correct because these small businesses won't make it. They don't have enough cash and even the households behind them, we all know the terrible, horrific numbers that you know half of Americans don't even have 400 bucks for an emergency. So this is the crucial problem, and you can time is not your friend here. Second, they believe that if they do unlimited quantitative easing, that will somehow mainly fix it. But that presumes, number one, the banks are actually going to unlend it, which they are definitely not going to do because the credit quality is collapsing as we speak. And so it's not going to be the channel they expect. And second, uh, I think what we're really going to need, they're not even thinking about, and that is another resolution trust corporation type structure like we had in the late 80s, early 90s, when you have a lot of things go bust simultaneously. You know, cause, look, I'm an American Republican, so I believe in markets and I believe markets normally clear broken assets very well, very quickly. But this is different. This is all the restaurants, all at the same time, all the corner shops, all at the same time. And in that environment, you're going to need a mechanism, in my opinion, to bring these assets in, wrap them in 30 to 50 year debt, sell that out to the market, and then begin to parse apart and sell at auction for call it five cents on the dollar. So that there's an incentive for new owners to come in and buy these fire sale items and then put them to work and rehire. And I think in the absence of doing that, basically what I'm saying is there are two ways out of this thing, orderly or disorderly. And the disorderly, I think, is looking more and more likely. But each country is different, too. And, you know, I'm based in the UK, so it's rather more severe here now because of the really comprehensive nature of the lockdown. And the last thing to say is that everything depends on how the lockdown ends. And I've got some views on that, too. Well, when, uh, let's first, before we get into like, you know, how it ends and every, being on the other side, which is a, a very much a nonlinear, uh, I think we agree on that, the, the, the outcome is going to be nonlinear, and that, that would be the first place to start. But just on, on the causal factor here, and, and again, you're using a pretty morbid but a realistic uh, um, metaphor here with cancer. Um, cancer is the debt. Now, 
Now, the debt part, um, you know, how far reaching is that? Because you, you talked about a lot of traditional businesses. Um, as you know, plenty of uh, venture and private equity fully loaded is just lathered with debt and has zero cash flow. Um, you know, profitless companies, good ideas, uh, which uh, you're going to talk about good ideas and how you always talk about your signal. And I'm quite excited about that. And most people generally should be. But at this stage of the cycle, what is it about profitlessness that is so far reaching? It's not just shitty companies. No, it's not. Uh, it's also a mentality that we've had. I spoke to one of the biggest um, financial advisory companies in America, you know, huge brand name. And they went into this COVID crisis with a billion in cash in the bank. <laughs> and all the analysts had been, you'll probably be able to guess which one it is from what I said. But, <laughs> uh, but what's important is all the analysts beat the hell out of them saying, why are you having all this cash? You're not using it efficiently, blah, blah, blah. Okay, now they are in a beautiful position. They are hiring like crazy. They are supplying all their team with beautiful technology to work from home. They are, uh, they're acing it. And meanwhile, their competitors who didn't have any cash in the bank are all going bust. And as they do all that talent, they're going to get to pick up the best talent from those other companies. So I would put it this way. What we've had is what a universal, timeless argument between efficiency and resilience. And I'll use an analogy of what happens in Formula One. In Formula One racing, the mechanics constantly try to shave one gram of one tiny little amount of weight <laughs> off of that vehicle because that may be the thing that lets you win the race, but it might be the thing that causes the car to just snap in half. And what we've done is put so much emphasis on efficiency and we've completely forgotten about resilience. And what COVID did was put a little extra weight on this vehicle and everything snapped. Yeah. And that is the situation. And so now there's going to be return to focus on resilience. And that means the broken supply chains and they're broken at both ends, the supply end and the demand end are all going to be readdressed. And uh, there are many implications of restoring resilience. But one of them, in my opinion, will be higher prices. Yeah. And one of them will be that a lot of companies simply weren't res resilient and it will be very hard to save them from certain death. Uh, and a lot of them won't make it. And we're going to have to reconstitute a new economy with a very different business model. And but I'll say the last thing on this, too. You know, why didn't we have enough ventilators? Answer, because no one in the VC or private equity world has been willing to touch hardware in the West for 15 years because we just thought we'll outsource all that to China and that will be fine. And, you know, I'm in that business. I make hardware, software, interface, autonomous vehicles, aerial drones, and now marine and terrain vehicles. And I can tell you that this idea that we don't have to touch hardware is not only over, but I would say hardware is going to be the new software in this next period of growth. Because it's the interface between hardware and software that lets you be resilient. Mm -hmm. I mean, resilience, and I think uh, Taleb calls it anti-fragility. Uh, there's so many things in a world of scarcity that you'd like to be long. You know, one of them, which has been revealed, which is cash, whether it's just being long of U.S. cash, or to your point, companies that actually had the sobriety to have uh, cash on their balance sheet at the peak of an economic cycle. Um, that whole point, I think that's a fantastic point, and your point on hardware, of course, is completely contrarian, which I'd only uh, expect to hear more of, of these types of things as we go throughout this discussion. Uh, but when we go into the, the, the scarcity place or the resilience place and, and, and maybe wrap this into the ongoing debate about um, the opposite of that, which is people that procyclically levered up their balance sheet, procyclically meaning at the very end of an economic cycle. As their profits are going negative, airlines are a great example. Uh, they leather, you know, lather themselves up, buy back stock, lather themselves up in debt, of course, uh, reduce the share account, get paid in earnings per share, and then they go and ask for a bailout. So that's not, that doesn't sound like resilience. That sounds like, uh, uh, you know, that sounds like a, a really bad thing that should be punished, no? So, you know, I've been writing in the last few years about leadership. And my last book, The Leadership Lab, got very much into this point that even before COVID, that the share buybacks would sooner or later emerge as a scandal. Uh, because, of course, this is a technical subject that the general public doesn't really understand. They're like, well, you know, what is a share buyback? <laughs> but when you explain it, 
And you say that, I don't know, something like more than 80% of all the returns those companies made went into pushing the share price up, which of course massively benefited the management of those companies, but didn't reflect something fundamental. I think this is going to be a scandal. And uh, more importantly, I don't think having asked for bailouts in the aftermath of those buybacks, and let's not even add to this, the huge, huge amounts of money that senior management were paying themselves, but not able to find 10 cents and a penny to pay a low wage worker. This is a fundamental break of the social contract, which, you know, I write all the time about the social yeah. contract, the implicit unspoken, but we all understand it has a feel to it. That doesn't feel right. And I suspect that part of the new social contract post COVID is share buybacks yeah. are going to be gone. Mm -hmm. They're just not going to be acceptable as part of corporate strategy. And frankly, that's also been a contributing factor to the economy not performing as well as it could have been, because instead of investing in technology, in people, in growth, a lot of that money just got skimmed off into the share price and management taking their cash out. Yeah, That's just, not what grows the economy. Well, I mean, it's also, it's again, it's it's bad behavior. It's not bad behavior in terms of, you know, people seeking to get themselves paid. That's that's America. That's the oh, UK. Yeah. That, that is what it is. But it's just stupid. I mean, that's what it is. When your business yeah. is slowing and you you voluntarily choose to leather, you know, again, lather yourself up with more leverage, uh, there's a reason why the, the, the average tenure of a, a CEO in, in the S&P 500 is like 4.2 years. They don't give a shit, like longer term, well, about a lot of different things. And that's what pisses people off. Now, on that, um, the most disappointing part about that discussion, and thanks for always you know calling it that, because this is not new to you, but it's new to some people that might be watching you for the first time today. Uh, there are real people in this world. You know, you know, God forbid we actually listen to them. Uh, and people do have feelings. I, I, I get a lot of feelings coming back my way on Twitter. I'm sure you do too. Uh, but this whole yeah. debate that rang itself up on, and it was actually the first time I watched CNBC that wasn't on mute because it was a great, it's a great debate, you know, between Shamath and, um, yeah. you know, the, the kind of the purveyor of bullshit uh, from the corporate side, which was Scott Wapner. Um, but again, yesterday, I still, I, I still think there was a struggle there. I don't know if you saw it. Um, so, so, you know, Shamath just basically lays 5,000 punches on the poor guy because he explains things like return on invested capital, like really basic stuff. Uh, and, then, and then he turns around and Wapner finally lands a blow by saying, but why do you think uh, your buddy Richard Branson should get a bailout? And, 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 and the VC guy struggled with the answer. What do you think about that? Well, I think this is a microcosm of this bigger societal question, uh, which is, it's not even so specific as that. It's also how and why is capital being allocated in the economy? No, what nobody's talking about, in my opinion, is 30% of all private equity and venture capital funds have come from where? Pension funds. And who are pension funds? That's grandma. That's you. That's a regular person who's worked. And why have the pension funds put so much into that space? Because it's easy to say, well, the return in 10 or 15 years is going to be some huge number. And since it's so far away, you can kind of say whatever you want. And it gives them a lot of latitude. But if the VC and PE returns are now going to cause the pensions to be underfunded, then that is a social issue. That's yeah. not a technical major investment issue. issue anymore. That's a major societal issue. And, and the, the, see, the BCMP guys, you know, who are just doing the job and trying to do it well, they're not thinking in terms of they're going to be accountable to the general public. Congress will eventually hold hearings and there'll be a question. You know, they often say, the VC crowd especially, you know, we invest in 10 companies and one or two are unicorns and the rest fail, but that's okay because <laughs> unicorns do so well. And the public's going to be like, with my money, you did what? Yeah. Like, and they'll have to explain that, that attitude, that way of thinking. And I don't think it's going to be very easy to make their case when that moment comes. Um, and again, against the backdrop of the public going, no, wait a minute. You told me that you, the government, told me that I couldn't have a bailout. Only banks could have a bailout. And I had to have austerity. And now you've <laughs> like turned the taps on again for banks. And so, you see what I mean? It's yeah. just an accumulated lack of 
sense that people are making. And so the assumption is that grandma's not going to ask any questions. And my belief is she is. Oh, she is. She is. She is. My mom, my mom's a retired teacher. She's on a pension. Mm. My dad, retired yeah. firefighter, 38 years in the fire department, on a pension. Uh, they're asking. Their, their friends are asking. Uh, and again, like, I, I want to get back to that. Like, you, I, I think the, the whole, the idealism of, of, of uh, Shamath, uh, I don't know the guy. Um, um, and, and there's nothing personal against him. I just want to, I, I want the discussion to be objective without a conflict of interest. I mean, why can't yeah. we just do that? Like, you and I can do that because, you know, you, you, know you, I don't think that you're going to be pushing your book on a robotics company right now. And, and, and I'm not certainly, uh, Hedge Eye stock doesn't trade publicly. Uh, what I want to know is the truth, right? So what yeah. we have in the, in, the, you know, in the MSM to teach my mom and dad or grandma and grandpa uh, is MSM. Now, the only thing worse than MSM politically, as people properly know it, is financially having, <laughs> having this, these types of debates. So that's a thing about the social contract that I see as a big opportunity here. I had a great discussion with, I'm sure you know him, Grant Williams. Um, his whole, oh, yeah. Grant's fantastic. You know, Grant's sitting there, one of the founders of Real Vision, and, and I think um, he made a very good point, which is, he, why can't we, fully loaded with all of our conflicts of interest, just have a real discussion about this? Like, why can't the people hear that? And I wonder if that's one of the big opportunities, because when you talk about resilience or I think about scarcity, that discussion or the one that we're having right now is absolutely scarce. Totally. So this is part of a bigger phenomena that I came across uh, in the, when I started publishing books. And it's a belief system that, for example, most publishers take the view the public is not very switched on or intelligent. They don't care about economics or any hard subjects. So you're allowed to present one idea in your book, and then you have to hammer that thing to death in the <laughs> second, third, fourth, fifth, eighth chapter, and that's it. Now, I refused to play the game that way, and I ended up crowdfunding my first book. And my last book, The Leadership Lab, last year in 2019, it won the Business Book of the Year Award, and I had tons of ideas in there and, and assumed my reader was going to have to like jog a bit quickly to keep up with where we're going. So part of it is the assumption that this is all too hard for the general public, and I profoundly disagree with that. Part of it is also uh, the belief that uh, the system as we have it constructed makes sense, and therefore it's not subject to question. And this is part of a bigger phenomena that is this, um, it's been called the death of expertise. And the kind of high priests of our generation, you know, they're not, they're not religious priests or you know, like in the Roman Empire, the high priest of the state. <laughs> in our generation, the high priests are experts. Yeah. And we've had an environment where people are not allowed to question experts. But in the last few years, with the rise of populism, they have been. And and while some of that has got, you know, President Trump into office and people have very mixed views about whether, whether that's a good or a bad thing, but what it shows us is that the public is now prepared to say, just because you're an expert doesn't mean you're correct. Mm -hmm. And so the debate is opening up, and I think that's a very healthy thing yeah. to go back and ask basic questions. And you'll notice all the Nobel Prize winners can explain their subject, no matter how complicated, in a way that anybody can understand it. And that is the true test of genius, and more people in the financial market should be able to explain what they're doing in a way that a regular person can understand. And if they can't, something's up. Yeah, something's up big time. And to be resilient, you actually kind of have to be aware of everything. I mean, uh, there is this thing called fractal math or modern math uh, that has really submitted that you should have a multi-factor, multi-dimensional approach to how you look at everything if you want to understand that there could be nonlinear risks that you're going to have to realize. And nonlinear uh, is obviously what a good, uh, I'd say, I don't know what the number is, but it's certainly north of 80% of companies were not prepared for that. Um, and that's, that's a really interesting thing. I mean, how do you think, and, and maybe this is... Um, yeah, and then we'll get on to uh, you know some of the, some of some of the bigger ideas that you have. Like like how 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 can one um, as a management team just turn around? When well, we're talking about people that aren't, aren't exactly young pups at a lot of companies, in some cases they are. I mean, it's not like uh, Zuckerberg's an old guy, um, but it gets not about being old. It's actually about be, having an open mind, having an ability to evolve, having an ability to change. You know, how many how, how many executives are going to be forced to change or even able to change at this point to that type of thinking in terms of leading their companies? 
Yeah, this is the, the core message that I've been pursuing with regard to leadership. The first thing is that this game is not about prediction. It's because prediction assumes, as you say, that linear, you know, either or. And people yeah. have been doing that for years. You know, Brexit won't happen. President Trump won't be elected. Yeah, this is a linear predictive thought process. It's not where you should be. You should be in the realm of preparedness, where you're beginning to think about a multitude of possible scenarios, some of which sound completely crazy. Because let's face it, the completely crazy stuff is what has been consistently happening in recent years. <laughs> so, you know, we need to open our minds to a scenario approach. Now, management will say, oh, this takes too long and it costs time. And I'm like, well, you know, what really costs time is being completely unprepared for scenarios that actually were not impossible that you didn't bother to think about. Another piece of the puzzle is that the management style of our generation We've all been trained to be highly analytical. And so we look at numbers, we look at data, and we believe if I just drill down deeper into that, I can find the answer. But actually, this environment we're in requires not analytical, but what I call parenthetical. Mm. Parenthetical is about the ability to look up and to connect the dots between silos to see the landscape. And you use the word feelings. This is very important. Analytical people think it's all about facts. But in a parenthetical world, how people feel actually does matter. And you can dismiss it, but it will come back to bite you. And so this is the thing to become more holistic in your thought process about what are you dealing with here? And particularly COVID, COVID is all about how people feel. This is a confidence crisis more than anything else. Mm -hmm. And that's what government's gonna have to address. Get people in a place where they feel that there's some outcome that's investable at the end of all this. And until they feel that, you won't restore confidence. <laughs> yeah, you're going to, I need to have you here with me every day to, uh, <laughs> on, the, on this whole feelings thing. Because I, I, you know, I, I got a lot of, I got a lot to say about feelings. Um, but, um, but one of your ideas is actually, to me, the way I read it, and it's like, I don't, I don't know how to be long of it, but you, you, you want to be long lawyers. And to me, there's a yeah. lot of feelings that those lawyers are going to have to address. There's a lot of feelings in the oh, home, yeah. in the company. Uh, like you said, people, you know, pensioners who now understand, you know, what, what, what they're on the hook for. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So think of it this way again. Um, the debt burden is like a wrecking ball and it, the weight of it bears down on the society and it breaks the promises that hold us together. And one of those promises is you can retire at 65 with this kind of pension. So now COVID it maybe just caused that social fabric, that social promise set to rip. So now the lawyers have to be at the center because that's the re-knitting together of the social contract and the suing about the, the breakage. And it's just gonna happen on multiple levels. I mean. At one end, you're going to have divorce lawyers making a mint because people have been locked up with the partner <laughs> that they now realize is like not the right partner for them, right? You know, some people are delighted to be home with their loved ones, but a lot of people are not so delighted. Um, and then, as you say, it's going to be um, debt covenants that got broken. It's going to be in the UK, the government came out and said nobody has to pay rent, mortgage, or taxes for three months. Can you imagine the lawsuits that are going to arise just from the government having made a, a policy position? Now, the problem for the lawyers is that the question is, they may be able to do all that work, but are they going to get paid? Right. Like, what's the cash flow situation? And I think this fundamental question is so profound is where is the cash coming from? And I'll make a massive leap now and say, you know, I've argued for a long time that governments have been very drawn to the idea of digital money. And that's different from electronic money. I'm not talking about the electronic version of physical or monetary money. I'm talking about an entirely new species of currency that is digital and sovereign in nature, which the Chinese have said they want, and now they're rushing to get there. The EU has said it. And what that means is a, the political world can literally double or have the money supply with a single keystroke. They can put money straight into everybody's bank accounts, and they can target it. They can say, I only want it to go to families who voted in a particular way and who live within two miles of something or another. Like, it's heroin for politicians. Yeah, and for this brutal. reason, I think they're going to want it. And that is going to be an entirely new social contract 
because what I'm talking about is the end of one system of money and accounting and the introduction of a new system of money and accounting. And we've seen that happen in history before. You know, I've talked about when it happened in 1834 in the United Kingdom. So it can easily happen. Yeah. People don't believe that that's, if you can't just abandon the whole system of money and accounting and start again. Yes, you can. And that also is a fundamentally legal process that I expect to unfold. So now we're gonna to need to use our imagination in a big way, because these are not narrow problems anymore. These are big conceptual problems that yep. we're talking about. Well, big, I mean, the biggest, and it gets right down to the biggest problem that the most, again, and it's not about education, it's about being human. The, the biggest question that people have in their minds in you know, times like this is the, the health safety of their families and where is the money? So when you said, where's the cash? That's a great question, first of all. Um, but second of all, uh, I, we, I just had a real conversation with, uh, who I'm sure you know, Daniel DiMartino Booth about this. And, okay. and she thinks on where's the cash and, and how the Fed uh, co-opted with the Treasury to do this. She thinks yeah. that the lawyers that are gonna be busiest are gonna be at the Supreme Court level with the Fed. Now, what do you think about that? Do you think the Fed in, you know, and, 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 and I don't know on what duration, I'd prefer that um, P.E. Powell gets a little uh, gets to take a little prance up to um, to the Supreme Court, like imminently. But um, do you think that's possible? Do you think it's going to happen? Do you think it could happen in a short period of time? So I think she's right that that this is the question. Uh, now this goes back to the immediate post-war periods, the Second World War, when there was an accord between Treasury and the Fed. And that agreement was that the Fed would basically fund whatever Treasury needed to do because, you know, a war had happened and there was a need for a massive reconstruction effort. And the end of that accord, which uh, I don't remember the exact year, it was in the uh, 50s that it was finally the Fed said, that's enough. We're not going to be the printing press for the Congress mm -hmm. and end of that. And that was the beginning of central bank independence, proper independence. Well, we've, in my opinion, we have lost that independence through a series of decisions in recent years and crises that have forced the Fed to, you know, basically underwrite a ton of stuff. And so this position now is that they would never say that the Treasury Fed Accord uh, has profoundly changed. And basically the Fed has become an instrument of monetary, of, of fiscal policy. They would never, ever say that. But if you really look at it, that exactly what has happened and we've <laughs> yeah. lost the independence of the fed they can say they're independent all they want but if they're buying every junk piece of paper in the economy um then something else is going on now is it contestable in the courts i think it's gonna be very interesting to see someone try and i suspect the supreme court is gonna say no uh that the fed is not i mean the fed is part of the government it's always been a very well-crafted illusion that the Fed has this separate and independent status, a very valuable illusion, a very needed, in my opinion, because I'm a big believer in central bank independence. But it's not written in stone that they have to be, and it's very difficult for them to prove that they are or aren't. So I think, sure, we can test it, but what we don't have anymore is real clarity that the Fed is committed to its, what it should be, which is price stability. Mm -hmm. They're committed to the economy's stability. That's different from price stability. And now you're gonna get me into a subject that's hugely, hugely controversial, which is, are they at risk of stoking inflation? And I know most people would be like, but you are out of your mind. We're in a deflationary downdraft. How can you even think that this is a possibility? But my view is, yeah, but you know what? With this amount of money thrown into the system, and COVID being a temporary phenomena, even if it's a year or even 18 months, it's still temporary. Yeah. And then how are you going to pull all that money back out? Answer, you're not. And I think the Fed's position right now is let the engine run hot, get inflation to at least two and a half. If it got, went to three and a half or four, that would be great. Let employment go back to the 3% level, which, by the way, is like a record high. And then we'll talk about taking the money away. Well, in that world, prices are definitely going to go up. However, they no longer have technology holding the prices down or the global supply chain holding the prices down. That's what used to prevent when we did the bailout of the banking sector. Why didn't we get inflation then? Well, we went from 1% to 25 so we did. 
but it was considered acceptable amount. But now what stops it at that higher level? Answer, nothing. And so I'm a little concerned that we maybe have set the stage for an inflation at exactly the moment that everyone says, well, there wasn't any last time, so there isn't going to be any this time. <laughs> and Pippa, you're nuts. And there wasn't nobody a virus even reads last to, <laughs> Yeah, and nobody even needs to read about inflation yeah. anymore because it's dead. And I'm like, hmm. And, and can I add one more little thing yeah. on here? Because now, back to what you were saying, this is a human issue. The genie that's come out of the bottle is not inflation. It's inflation expectations. And I know people have been willing to pay a, a dollar or a pound for an egg in this COVID crisis. And a five, a five dollar or a five pound note for a loaf of bread because they've experienced now an actual shortage where you couldn't get eggs. And this is the psychology. This is how it begins. And people start to go, oh, I may need to buy a bunch of things because we may need them later. This is where inflation expectations become real. But the way people look at it is, look at the bond market. Yeah, but the bond market's not reflecting anything. It doesn't even tell you anymore what inflation expectations are. It just tells you about asset liability matching. So I think the human side is the important side to keep an eye on here. Well, the bond market, too. Don't forget, the bond market is effectively, in the short term, pricing in the deflation that we just had, like T-1, minus which is when oil trades at negative per barrel, you know, in, yeah. in terms of like that inflation, but it's also what gives birth to the bottom in bond yields and the bottom in the CRB index or basic commodities, uh, the essences of, of, of feeding your family. You know, that they bottom, you can only inflate from there. I, I can't try to remind people that enough. The, the call on inflation is an easy one to make. The, the, the hard thing is, is, is making the, the timing. Um, so I obviously have an opinion on that. I think that it's gonna be some point in June or July, we finally get the fi final um, reports of quote unquote deflation, but that's 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 just the view. I want to get to these some of these questions because they're piling up here, Pippa. If you don't, sure, um, sure. if you don't mind, <laughs> one one if I could like ring fence it because uh, this is what people really uh, love you for, which is you know you know give me the wood, you know give me the sectors, give me the you know the subsectors. Uh, when yeah. you talk about your signal, and and that's pretty much the highest ranked question here. Uh, can you talk about maybe do the sectors first in terms of like what you think are going to be positively impacted by this? Okay, first let's do even bigger picture. I think we're gonna end up a little bit like the 1920s. So there's gonna be a group of people who have a ton of cash, very asset rich, and they're gonna be so happy to be alive after COVID that they are gonna be buying endless champagne and we're gonna have the new great Gatsby of our generation. <laughs> At the other end, just like in the 1920s, where they had 60% of the American public were at or below the poverty line, uh, you're going to have a lot of people who've been thrown out of work and can't get a foothold again, and they're going to be in trouble for a while. So that's the grapes of wrath. So both novels came from, you know, that same period of history, and I think we're going to see a similar phenomena this time. So much depends on which part of the economy are you feeding into. I could make a case for the luxury goods companies are going to be flying, uh, some of them, when this rolls back into normal n normalcy. And I can make a case for basic stuff. Like I'll, I'll go so far as to say, I think a company like Procter & Gamble may turn out to be a better credit risk than most G7 government debt instruments. <laughs> and we're, we may even see the market sell off government debt and with a preference to hold equities because they generate a genuine unimpaired cash flow. Now that's a, that's a shocker of a thing to say. To say Procter & Gamble may beat the G7 debt markets as a safer place to hold your money is a hell of a world. That that requires a little reflection. That's a very bold call that I'm making, but I think we, we could easily get to that. Uh, in terms of the sectors, you know, uh, I think we're seeing, um, because the supply chain is broken at both ends, we're gonna see people rebuild the supply chain nearby. Yeah. So manufacturing is absolutely coming back. And I will go so far as to say hardware will be the new software. And particularly deep data hardware will be the new software. That's going to be the cool new thing to invest in. Um, anything to do with uh, meeting the public's basic needs, like, you know, Amazon is absolutely flying and will continue to through this process. And I think other people are going to figure out how to get better at delivery. 
any company that becomes digital, and frankly, we've had an extraordinary shift to digital in this environment. Yoval Hariri did a great interview where he said, um, for 10 years, my university tried to deliver some of the courses online, and now we've taken the entire university online in a week. <laughs> yeah, that, okay. Yeah. Which, by the way, raises a really big question about what is the um, value of the university system and do they all need all these overheads? And so I, I talked to one CEO who, of a major company and he said to me, you know, Pippa, what it's made me realize, what COVID made me realize, I, and I quote him, I'm the middle-aged white guy who wasn't willing to become digital and who said no to working from home. But now I'm doing it. I realize actually it totally works. So why do we have all these overheads? <laughs> it totally works. So, you know, so, and, and, and this is uh, in a way, for example, I think it's great for women or for people who are more at home and need to be at home more, that they're going to be able to participate in the new workforce vastly more effectively and with greater welcome because of these events. So there's there's upside, there's downside, the whole, I mean, it's all over the shop. But what I try to do is put up on Twitter examples of sectors, and I'll give you one that nobody's talking about, um, you know, because you always want to know what's the new cool thing. Yeah. And I think cloud clubbing is the new cool thing. And what is cloud clubbing? Well, there was a, a famous DJ called Zook who was due to give a concert out of Paris when COVID broke out. And rather than just cancel the thing, he decided cleverly to just go online. And now you have DJs and, and um, basically live rave parties that happen. And all over the world, people are joining Zoom to be on those live things, they are flying. And you know, that's gonna be the new radio. That's gonna be the new way that people connect to what's the cool new music. You're not gonna go listen to the radio anymore or whatever, uh, you're, you know, even Spotify. You're gonna go on to these live raves and you're gonna get to see what, how do people dance and what are they wearing? And <laughs> what, that? what well, else it's, are it's they reality. doing? It's reality television yeah. meets music production. So yeah. I think anybody who gets in the cloud clubbing space, we're going to be investing in that. I like that. I like that. I think we kind of run a bit of a club here. Um, so thanks, thanks for being part of it. Uh, this this question is now the top rated question. And again, it doesn't surprise me given what you just said about inflation. Um, but it also actually, and thank you for this, it incorporates our methodology. Uh, and for people that um, don't know, just pop up the four quadrants so that people know what the quads are. Um, what specific signals and areas are you watching to, to mark a change from deflation to cost push and or demand pull? Inflation, Keith talks about going from quad four to quad three, um, which is basically what it is, right, Pippa? So you get, yeah. you're, I'm showing you here, you're here on the on our four quad map. The what I, what I mean by deep quad four is the dot on Q2 2020 is down as far as you can get into the, the, the left corner. Uh, so mathematically speaking, once you hit the low of the bottom left corner and you move into the right or up into the right, you are going to have reflation and then inflation. Of course, when you're in the top right corner in quad two, like the economy um, you know, has had multiple times, you know, the government still won't say that there's inflation, but there obviously is. Um, so, so what is it, um, you know, when you're, what are you looking at, I guess is the question here, and signals when you're looking for, you know, for, for more confirmation on making that turn? Yeah, well, a couple different things. One is, first of all, here's the general rule. When the government gives you free money, you're supposed to take it. And then the point of, <laughs> you're supposed to take it. And when they give you zero interest rates and free money, they're telling you, please go put this to work. I don't care what you do, buy a house, invest in the market, whatever, build a company. But the point is at the beginning of these crises, everybody goes, oh, it's very dangerous and I don't know. And then look what happened after the financial market crisis last time, woof, everything goes up. So my view is you don't wanna fight the government. If they're giving you free money, you should take it and you should put it to work because the whole purpose of the policy is to drive prices up and to make it painful for you to hold cash. So I know that's scary because it means you've got to get involved in at a time when, as as you know, as often said, that, you know, you invest when there's blood in the street. Well, that's right. So your real question to yourself is: Do you believe there will be an economy tomorrow? Or do you believe that there is a possibility that there is no economy tomorrow? I've never seen no economy tomorrow. There's always an economy. 
So I think it's an easy trade that you start to go, okay, you give me free money, I put it to work. That's reflation. Um, the second thing is uh, little signals that I'm finding very interesting, like in the UK, and I don't know about the States, you have a different situation over there, but uh, there's been a shortage of flour because everybody started yep. making bread at home, right? And why is there a shortage? It turns out it's not because there's a flour shortage. It's because there's a shortage of the packaging for the flour. Literally, there isn't a production level that will satisfy the amount of flour that people want to buy. So you've got flour that isn't in a package. Now that will be fixed. Yeah. And so don't. And so be careful with your signals. Is it really a flour shortage or is it something that temporary that's going to get addressed? You mentioned earlier about um, the global supply chain shutting down. You know, there, there's a signal that's very worrying, which is governments are saying no export of certain things, medicine, food. You know, they're in a hoarding mentality now, keeping whatever they think that their population needs. That can create some price pressures and some uh, strange incentives for production. So just I think the main thing is when you see weird things happening the, to question why and what underpins that. And the people who are going to be most thorough and open minded are the ones who are going to find the investment opportunities for yeah. sure. And again, I'm not sure it's going to be sector specific. I think it's going to be much more company specific. Every company that embraces the digital transition, that's who you want to be with. The, by the way, then again, you're going to have to ask the question at some point, what if the electricity goes out? Because when you go fully digital, yeah, then you can't operate in cyber attacks or if the electricity goes out. So that's a different question about resilience yep. versus efficiency. Here's a good question about resilience and um, we're running out of time to a degree here, but uh, this, is a, this is a good question. Um, and, and of course, they're going to ask you because you're in the UK and this is not a typical question that Americans ask. Uh, does, does the foreign public and or the foreign private sector have any incentive to hold treasuries or dollars anymore? They do, uh, but some years ago, China already started to say, why are we buying these paper financial assets from the Americans when we could be buying real assets? Right. And I think that the, the Belt and Road Initiative, which is all about owning bridges and roads and highways and digital infrastructure for the globe, that they came to view as being more valuable than treasuries. Now, we're going to see because it's an open question. It may be that they have bought a whole bunch of white elephants that are never going to make the return and are not going to pay off for them. Or it may be that the value of those networks is so great to the Chinese economy and allows them to sell excess capacity in markets that they wouldn't have access to otherwise. It, it's a very interesting question. Is that Was that smart or not? What I can tell you today is that most emerging markets are leveraged to the hilt with their debt denominated in dollars. Yep. And they do not have enough dollars to pay that debt off. And I anticipate we're going to see some governments announce defaults. And I suspect that whoever does default actually becomes a viable story after that happens. Mm -hmm. The default picture is very interesting. I think we're going to have a lot of defaults. And, and I think actually that clears the, the balance sheets of the world economy in a way and makes it easier for you to grow. The whole thing comes down to how do you do it? So if you stand up and you say, I'm just never going to pay you guys back, forget it, then that's called the Argentine style default. And nobody likes that. And they'll hate you for 20 years. And it's not advisable. But the second way, which is you say, I'm so sorry, but uh, I can't pay you back. But I'm going to, it's just a little later and a little less. We call that the Greek style haircut. And everybody loves that. And the Financial Times will write, they did not default. They merely extended the payment. And that sounds pretty good. Okay, it's totally a default, but it just feels better. It's back to your view. It feels better, yeah, it right? Does. It's not it factually does. any different. It just feels better. And then the other obvious way is inflation. And again, with the Fed telling you, we're going to let the engine run hot. We want inflation to go, you know, three and a half would be fine. Guess how fast you run down America's debt if you're running at three and a half percent inflation? Pretty quickly. Yeah. So, you know, I would bet on those things.
Yeah. Uh, okay. Cool. The, uh, now, this uh, I was going to ask. This is the last question, anyway. It's not the high, highest rated, but selfishly, I want to hear Pippa's answer to this. Uh, it's a pretty straight up question. Like, and how does EM fare in the post uh, in the post COVID nineteen world, anyway? Well, first of all, the emerging markets have not yet dealt with COVID, and so we have no idea what the human impact is. Uh, Africa, you know, they're not social distancing, they don't have data, they didn't shut the borders. Uh, all of the stuff that's happening in the industrialized world, we cannot take for granted in the emerging markets. So, the, and this is not, these are not places that have typically sophisticated hospital systems. So we're, we, we're gonna, yet, we have yet to see how the disease takes its toll on, on those populations who also suffer from many pre-existing conditions, including poverty as a pre-existing condition. As I said, debt is a pre-existing condition. Uh, lack of appropriate, frankly, you know, water availability is a yeah. pre-existing condition. So I, my heart breaks and, and I wish there was some easy answer, but we don't know yet the impact. Yeah. That's one thing. Second thing is um, then what are they able to do in the aftermath? And there's a lot of question mark about, for example, produce and mining. You know, we take agriculture for granted, but as an example, they just canceled, and I'll come to Germany, right? This is not an emerging market, right? One of the G7 countries, one of the, you know, G5, and they've just canceled Oktoberfest, not explicitly because of COVID, but because they have a shortage of hops for the beer, because 90% of it comes from one particular district and all of it is picked by immigrant laborers who are now not able to enter the country to, to harvest. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now you don't have beer in Germany. Now imagine that on a global scale, you are not able to harvest. This is going to cause ripples in food pricing and food availability globally. And I think we have yet to see this and emerging markets make most of their income on tourism, food, and, uh, things you take out of the ground, including mines, mining and minerals and stuff. Mm -hmm. So all of those are yet to be known how that makes its comeback. It's, it's open. We just don't know. We think it's going to be a tough ride in emerging markets for a while. Well, I love how you answered the question because, you know, the question was posed with the post. And a lot of people talk about the post or the other side. And, and I think a lot of people still have to just you know, acknowledge that we're still in it. Uh, and if we're not in it locally, somebody else is in it somewhere else. And that's, that's like, you know, that's, that's the real thing that we're going to come to realize is the nonlinearity uh, of, of the geography of it all. Um, and, and, and sorry, you're going to say something. And you're totally right. Not only that, but the, this virus mutates. So we already have an open question. Are there three strains? Are there mm -hmm. eight strains? Mm -hmm. If you've already had it, are you immune to the others? Probably not. So just because we've been through one wave of it doesn't mean it's over for any of us. No, it's not. And even I think, close. yeah. So this is all open questions. And it, and it comes back. I mean, Neil Howe, who you know, uh, our our chief demographer, uh, just keeps telling you, telling me, hey, it's a virus, man. It's going to come back, and, and that's what viruses do. Uh, and of course, yeah. we're working on a lot of uh, potential solutions for that. But even our director of research today is from, of all places, you'll like this, uh, from Bassano, Alberta. Okay, Alberta is a is in a real tough spot, obviously, with oil going yeah. to negative. Um, but again, the, the the town that's adjacent to his small town, which has got a big meat packing um, uh, facility, basically that got it. So there's like 300 people in a very small town of something like 1,500 or 2,000 people. So that lights up, you know, like as a bigger flares up as a big issue, like literally this week. Um, so that, those are the kinds of things where, wow, like you said, like supply chain, food, local, you know, these are, um, you know, you make us think, Pippa, and that's the, the number one thing. I could, do, I could do this, if I do it actually, if we do this every day, I'm going to, my mind's going to, I already, I, I only have so much capacity here and it's obviously off a low base. Um, but you would literally make my mind like explode. Like I, <laughs> I have to numb myself down and trade this damn market, which is another issue yeah. entirely. Um, but you've really done that again today. I mean, I, you, it's, this, this, oh. these times are, are perfect for you. They're perfect for, for Dr. Pippa. So thank you. Uh, I, I suspect Thank that you, you probably have a new book coming out on this. You got to just keep 
illuminating. I do, I do. It's good. You uh, do? Yeah, I've got, actually, two are going to come. I just a couple days ago finished the manuscript for the sequel to the Leadership Lab. Oh, you did? Cool. Uh, which will come out probably next September. But, I, but my main thing now I'm writing about is um, this digitization and what, that creates a whole new investing environment. I'm excited about explaining that. Awesome. That's uh, well. We'll have you on, and you're going to explain that in full, if you don't mind. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, we'll knock on your door, and uh, and we'll do a Zoom or something like this, and it'd be it'd be great. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So thanks. Thanks for making the time. We uh, we always appreciate it. The audience does too. She's Pippa Malgren. You can find her Dr. Pippa M on Twitter. Uh, she's fantastic, as you as you just realized. Thanks for thanks for spending some time with us. 